All right, students, we're finally here to the final day of the Purgatorio. We are on day four of the Purgatorio. This is Dante's The Divine Comedy Lecture 27, Purgatorio Lecture 10 Day 4, Entrance to Earthly Paradise, also known as Eden Matilda. Her name is spelled in several different ways. I'll accept any spelling. Different translations spell her name differently. This one has an E. I think yours might have an H and an I. It's okay. The Procession of Revelation in Paradise, the Introduction of Beatrice, and the Sad Departure of Virgil. We don't have a lot of time to uh, focus on that, though, because time is very important. And then we will ascend, at the end, to celestial paradise, to being among the stars. Stars that we could not even see at the beginning of the Inferno, or at least in Canto 3 when we went down into it. All right, earthly paradise, Cantos 28 to 33. Let's get started. So, the return to earthly paradise, sometimes called terrestrial paradise. Earthly and terrestrial mean the same thing. One is Latinic, one is Germanic in origin. These, uh, it is also called Eden, and that's an old Hebrew word as well. It is a return home. It is a return to the very first place that humans ever existed, um, according to the Old Testament, a place of pure potential where humans were innocent and naive and even naked. Uh, they did not even wear leafy branches or leaves like Odysseus would later wear in Book 6 when he meets Nausicaa. Very interesting uh, correlations there. That'd be an interesting paper to write. In any case, I want to make a connection here between the return to a forest at the top of Eden, which is called La Divina Foresta, the Divine Forest, and the Selva Oscura, the Dark Wood, that we first found ourselves in. It's almost as if this is the positive version of the negative place we started the Divine Comedy in. And so, here for you is now keen to search within to search around the forest, dense, alive with green, divine, which tempered the new day before my eyes, without delay, I left behind the rise, that's the mountain itself, in the ascent, and took the plain, advancing slowly, slowly across the ground, where every part was fragrant. His work is done. He has finally made it to this place of victory, this very interesting place from which humans first fell. And so... As I said, Eden is the first place that man existed, but is also the final stage of Dante's temporal journey. Just as the beginning exists outside of time, so does the end. Uh, and so, as I was saying, Eden was a place where man was innocent of sin, and where he strives to return to through time, spent on the purgatorio, work done during the day, and reflection done at night. And so, one goes from, uh, the, if you want to understand this allegorically, it's almost like when man was within Eden, in his start, first state of existence, he was perfect through ignorance. Because he was ignorant of all ills, and could not do ill. But, in returning to Eden, you are now uh, very much conscious of the ills in the world, and the ills within yourself, or the sins within oneself. In fact, you've had to cleanse them. And so, uh, if one is perfect in Eden like an animal, and that one is naive of all evil, uh, when uh, humans first began, uh, how one gets back to Eden is by being very much conscious of the evil in oneself and in humans and in the world, therefore. And so, sort of interesting allegory. In any case, let's get a little more matter of fact. Let's meet Matilda. So there is a guardian of Eden, just like there was a guardian of the shore of Purgatory. We call it the guardian of the shore of Purgatory was Cato. But now we have a figure who exists outside of Biblical and Greco-Roman mythology, Matilda. She is herself compared to Eve, who is a biblical character, the first woman who was married to Adam and had Cain and Abel as sons. She is also compared to Persephone, who you recall was the daughter of Demeter, who was abducted by her uncle Hades when she was next to a river, sort of like uh, Nausicaa when she meets Odysseus. Um, and so these are uh, images of women who were innocent before childbearing age, who were innocent of the influence of men. And so Matilda is herself a symbol of innocence, in this place of innocence, uh, uh, not, no longer ignorance of, uh, not a place ignorant of evil, but um, hmm, hmm, you might say uh, above it. Perhaps ignorant is correct. Um, and I, I will say why it's correct when I talk about the two rivers here that flow from a single source, Unoe and Lethe. And actually, it looks like that's what I'm going to talk about now. So, there are two rivers in this in this Eden, and they come from the same source, and they seem to be modeled after two very famous actual rivers in Mesopotamia, called the Tigris and the Euphrates. Now, these two rivers in the Garden of Eden, they have two very particular pow uh, powers, and one of which, the Lethe, you 
recall first seeing in Virgil's Underworld world in Book 6 of the Aeneid. We're going to see a lot of Virgil references before and as he disappears today, by the way, uh, and to his Aeneid in, in particular. But we also recall from the Old Man of Crete knowing that there were four rivers that went down into hell, the Inferno, but that there was one river that we were going to see at the top of Purgatory. Well, now that we are there, we know that that river is Lethe. And so, Lethe is a very famous mythological river. It comes from the Greek word lanthon, which means to forget. And so, when you are baptized into it, at the top of Eden, after burning away your sin through work and reflection and passing through the temporary fire at, at the end of the Terrace of Lust, you then dip your head into the Lethe. And the Lethe makes you forget all your wrongdoings, all your sins. Not everything as it made you forget in the Aeneid. And then you dip your head into the Unoe, which is an invention of Dante, not a mythological river, which means good mind or well-minded. And that reminds you of all the virtuous or good things you have done. And so at the end of your time in purgatory, you not only have removed all sin from yourself, but all memory of sin from yourself, which uh, will be sort of interesting because when we talk in the Paradiso, Two Souls in the Paradise, they will certainly remember some sins. And so there might be some inconsistency there. In any case, the idea is that Lethe removes memory of sin, and Unoe gives back memory of virtuous or excellent deeds. And so you are sort of left pure and uh, with the best things you ever did with you. And so that's, uh, I think, uh, a very pretty idea. In any case, we also see in this garden a very famous tree, the tree from which the tree that would starve and parch the souls in the, uh, the, uh, the Terrace of Gluttony came from. We recall that that tree came from a seed from this tree. This is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Yes, that tree that was mentioned in the first couple stories of Genesis where a snake, uh, that a snake was on that tempted Eve and said, if you eat from this tree and you know the knowledge of good and evil, you will not die. Unfortunately, that does not seem like it was quite true. In any case, the tree of knowledge of good and evil is here. All these first things, all these first fruits. In fact, um, it went, I will read you a quote at some point that will say that uh, the first seeds of all things exist here. The first fruits of all things exist here. This is a place of pure potential, of all human potential. Um, it is a place where all things are possible, and the idea is that, well, I might say allegorically, this is something like the human imagination, where all things we have have come from, in any case. And you must know the holy plane on which you find yourself is full of every seed, all potential, right? Seeds become plants. And it has fruit that there cannot be gathered. The water that you see does not spring from a vein that vapor, cold, condensed, restores, like rivers that acquire or lose their force, regular physical rivers. This is not a physical river. It issues from a pure and changeless fountain, which by the will of God regains as much as on two sides it pours and divides. On this side, it descends with the power to end one's memory of sin. That's the Lethe. And on the other, it can restore recall of each good deed. That's the Unoe. To one side, it is Lethe. On the other, you know, a neither stream is efficacious, that means works, unless the other's waters have been tasted. So you have to use them both together. Their savor is above all other sweetness, although your thirst might well be uh, satisfied even if I revealed more to you. All right. Now, something very interesting here. Uh, I'll give you freely, too, a corollary. Nor do I think my words will be less welcome to you if they extend beyond my promise. Those ancients who in poetry, this is Virgil and Statius, the men who are standing right next to Dante, presented the golden age, who sang its happy state, perhaps in their Parnassus, remember that's the uh, mountain of the Muses, as well as Mount Helicon, dreamt this place. Here mankind's root was innocent. The root is what leads to the sin. Uh, it is, uh, uh, you, you get back to your roots when you're looking at your ancestry. And here were every fruit and never-ending spring, these streams, the nectar of which poets sing. Then I turned around completely and I faced my poets, I could see that they had heard with smiles this final corollary spoken. All right, interesting. Here are a couple facts that we need to have. So, Belithi, as I told you, makes you forget your sins from life. You know it helps you remember the virtuous acts. The rivers come from the same source, and that's, and the source of both rivers <coughs> excuse me, is a pure and changeless fountain which pours forth by the will of God. Now, ancient poets 
used to apparently sing of Eden, like Statius, like Virgil. In fact, you recall from Virgil's Eclogue 4 that he literally sung of a golden age. Well, Dante has Matilda here say, oh, yes, well, uh, the ancient poets, they sung of a golden age, but what they were really singing of was this place, this Eden. And so uh, they got it right, but they also got it wrong at the same time. And recall that Dante turns around and he smiles at uh, Virgil and Statius. He gets to share a moment where uh, he sees that you are correct in one respect, but incorrect in another, but now you can see the mistake you made and fix it for yourself. And so ancient poets like Virgil, who sung of golden ages, were actually singing of uh, Edith. Cool. All right, we have three more direct addresses in Purgatorio, 13, 14, and 15. Reader, I am not squandering more rhymes in order to describe their forms. Since I must spend elsewhere, I can't be lavish here. So, we've made it to Eden. We've met Matilda. We've seen the two rivers of Eden. We know that there is a very fantastic tree. We know that an allegorical understanding of Eden is the place of all human potential before humans could recognize what it was they were capable of doing. Uh, another bit to add to that might be that this was a place, this was the place that humans existed in eternal naivete before they had the ability to conscious, rec consciously recognize that they were humans. This was the place that humans existed when they were as animals, before their ability to recognize the difference between good and evil. What gives you the ability to recognize the difference between good and evil? The fact that you have a rational intellect. And so, there could be an evolutionary reading of this. There could also be a historical or symbolic reading of this. In any case, we now get to see a pageant. Just as at the beginning of the Purgatorio, we are treated to the image of two, uh, or the movie really, of two angels expelling a snake or keeping a snake from entering the garden. Now we are going to see the procession of a magical chariot led by a griffin with uh, several, seven lights in front of it, 24 men, four uh, animals with uh, peacock wings around them, four women on the right wheel, uh, three women on the left wheel, and uh, seven men following behind. And then we're going to see that chariot attacked by an eagle, a dragon, and a fox, and we're going to see it transform into a giant. And what is described, uh, though this is a vulgar term, by a, uh, a prostitute, but your text uses the word whore. In any case, let's see what all of that means. Uh, after we see all of that, we will then ascend to heaven. Okay. Looking across the rivers in the terrestrial paradise, Dante witnesses a spectacular pageant of religious imagery, much of it based on Ezekiel, who is an Old Testament prophet, and the Apocalypse. That's one of, that is the other name for the book of Revelation, which is the final book in the New Testament. So we have Old Testament as well as New Testament figures here joined together, just as they are joined together in one book, which we collectively call the Bible. The Bible. And so, let's take a look at it. First and foremost, there are seven tall golden camel, camels. <laughs> camels. Leaving behind a rainbow trail of colors. Well, what do they represent? They represent the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, which are wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, piety, which means faith, and fear of the Lord, in Latin, timor dei, which is supposedly the beginning of wisdom. These candles themselves are in front of 24 mature men who are coming two by two, remember this is like a parade, dressed in pure white and wearing crowns of lilies. Something interesting about those crowns of lilies, and I want you to note what's on top of each of these uh, characters' heads, because I think you'll notice that there will be uh, people crowned with white, green, and red. Remember those are the colors of the theological virtues, those are the colors of Christmas, those are the colors of the current Italian flag. Uh, in any case, these 24 men, what do they represent? If you consider the 12 Old Testament prophets as one book, these are the 24 books of the Old Testament. Well, that makes sense symbolically because they are coming before the chariot that is led by a griffin. The griffin represents, in its dual nature, Jesus, and his dual nature as half divine, or rather fully divine, and fully human. He has a human nature and a divine nature. We'll talk about that soon. The chariot that he is leading is the church, the Christian church. Well, what came before the Christian church? The Hebrew church in the Old Testament, called the Hebrew Bible by the Jewish people. In any case, these 24 men do indicate, with their lilies on their heads, the books of the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament, which then comes before the New Testament. All right, let's keep getting to these symbols. Now, surrounding the chariot 
which I told you is itself a symbol for the church. And the griffin which is pulling it, which you can see here, is a symbol for Jesus, are the four animals. These uh, animals are the four evangelists. You say, who are the four ev evangelists? They are the four people who wrote Gospels. Luke, John, Mark, and Matthew. Um, and they are themselves historically represented as having different heads. Uh, an animal, or an ox head, an eagle head, a lion head, and a human's head. And uh, very interestingly about them having wings with peacock, uh, uh, like peacock feathers, is that this is a reference to um, Hera, or Juno, because recall that um, her specific, her, her animal, after Argus, a giant with many eyes, was killed by Hermes, who was guarding uh, Io, who was in the form of a cow. All the eyes from Argus, by Hermes, were then thrown into the tail of the peacock, and the peacock was given as animal to Hera. And so, interestingly enough, the idea here seems to be that these men saw much more than other people. If you have more eyes than people, you have more perspective than people. Sort of like if you're blind, uh, or like Polyphemus in any case, not like Tiresias or Demodocus from the Odyssey, you are, uh, you are missing something, literally speaking. <laughs> in any case, we have to keep moving. So, here's another image of the griffin, the chariot. Uh, there's Beatrice there, we'll talk about her soon. You can even see the uh, peacock wing having uh, guys, and you see the ox-headed one, the human-headed one, the eagle-headed one, and the lion-headed one there too, and that is, of course, a William Blake. That's why it looks so odd. In any case, so, we've seen the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, the seven candles, then the 24 men who represent the 24 books of the Old Testament. We've now seen the griffin, that is one part gold, uh, to indicate its divine nature, where it is an eagle, and one part uh, white with red, to indicate the purity and the uh, charity of its human nature, which is the lion part, which and I, I think it's a very good, interesting symbol. And this is also why purple is draped across crosses during Easter. The reason why um, the griffin is also partly red is because if it represents Jesus, part of Jesus' uh, nature was to be human and therefore to die. And to die by giving some blood. He was, of course, crucified. Um, and so that's why that red is present on this uh, griffin as well. In any case, next to the wheels of the griffin, we see next to the right wheel, three dancing women, colored fire red, emerald green, and snow white. So as you would expect, next to the right wheel, the better wheel, these are, of course, the theological virtues. Um, the one that's emerald green is, as you know, hope. The one that is white is faith. And the one that is red represents charity. Now, next to the left wheel, we see four dancing women. And if you see the theological virtues on the right, you would expect to see the cardinal virtues on the left, that is what these are. They are in crimson colored garments. And one of them, who is their leader, has three eyes. That is uh, prudence, the theological, or excuse me, the cardinal virtue of prudence, because in order to be wise, you must see the past, the present, and the future all as one. Hmm, very interesting. In any case, here is an image of the three theological virtues dancing together, because they are three and one, just like the triune God of uh, Dante's medieval Catholics, in any case. Now, coming after the chariot are the minor uh, epistles of the, uh, the uh, Christian New Testament. Uh, seven more men, also dressed in white, but now wearing crowns of roses. So we've seen red on people's heads, we've seen uh, uh, white on people's heads, and we've also seen green too. Uh, these include two old men who, one has the bearing of a physician, that's a doctor, that's Luke, who wrote the Acts of the Apostles. Traditionally, we think that Luke was a doctor, and is sometimes called a doctor of the church, and there are many others too. Uh, and then there's a second with a sword, his name is Paul, he wrote many of the letters of the New Testament. The New Testament is itself split into four uh, Gospels, as well as several very important letters by um, Paul, and then uh, I'll mention four other writers of minor, smaller epistles. Those are letters that come at the end. And so Luke and Paul are the most important of these seven, but here are the rest of them. We also have James. These are four men of humble appearance. Humble because they represent letters which were very short. Uh, James, Peter, John, and Jude. And then after them is a single old man who is another John, the John who is the writer of Revelation, he actually shows up in this divine procession three different times, in three different forms. 
Hmm. So, this whole parade has been a parade showcasing to you all of the books of the Old and the New Testament. Which is very interesting because it's like, we understood the first parade, or excuse me, the first <laughs> spectacular show that we saw before the purgatory to represent what the process of purgatory was. Uh, the process of chasing away sin from oneself, or expiating sin from one's life. It's almost as if what this parade indicates is uh, what the entirety of the Old and New Testament is trying to lead you towards, which um, in the case of Dante's Divine Comedy is understanding of heaven, or perhaps even understanding of one's own self. So, now let's focus on what happens to this chariot. Uh, now something, we've seen the parade go right, now things need to go terribly wrong. This will be the introduction of uh, church history to this scene. Alright, uh, but before we get there, we need to see somebody disappear and somebody appear. I turned around to my left, just as a little child, afraid or in distress, will hurry to his mother anxiously to say to Virgil, I am left with less than one drop of my blood that does not tremble. I recognize the signs of the old flame. That is actually a direct translation in, Ita well, in English from Dante's Italian of Virgil's Latin in the Aeneid when uh, Dido feels the signs of the old flame after she's been shot by Cupid's arrow when she sees Aeneas. Remember, she was like, I'm never going to marry somebody else again. Sakaius, my husband, was killed by my uh, brother Pygmalion. I will forever stay chaste. And then she got shot by an arrow by Cupid, met Aeneas, and then spent some time with him in a cave and definitely felt the signs of the old flame. She got the hot spot. In any case. But Virgil had deprived us of himself. That's also similar to the words that are used to describe um, uh, Aeneas, very sadly, when he looks for Creusa in book two of the Aeneid, and he fails to find her, and he says, my eyes have never had her back again. And so, just as uh, it was terrible, awful for uh, Aeneas to lose his wife, Creusa, now uh, Dante, after spending so much time with Virgil and being led through so many difficult things, Virgil is gone, and Virgil is now gone forever from his side. And but Virgil had deprived us of himself. Virgil, the gentlest father, he's compared to a father here. Virgil, he to whom I gave myself for my salvation. And even all our ancient mother, and so also described as mother, lost, was not enough to keep my cheeks, though washed with dew, from darkening again with tears. He cries. Virgil's gone. Dante turns to Virgil, but he is gone. And like I was saying, the signs of the ancient flame is a quote from Virgil's Aeneas about Dido's feelings for Aeneas after Cupid hits her with an arrow. Virgil is deprived, uh, or Virgil deprived Dante of himself, very reflexive there, as Creusa deprived Aeneas of herself in book two of the Aeneid by uh, being killed, essentially, is the idea. Virgil is here described as both father and mother, but like with the father and mother, Dante must now leave the nest. If he has been told by Virgil, which he has, that his will is now whole and complete and erect, and he can uh, make his own decisions, he no longer needs a physical guide. He can guide himself, which leads to one of the allegorical interpretations of what Beatrice is. Is Beatrice an angel, or is Beatrice um, uh, the liberated mind of Dante that exists within him that can lead him forward to truth? Um, another way that people have understood Beatrice in contrast to Virgil allegorically is that Virgil is human reason, and Beatrice represents faith. And so that human reason can get you the answer to many, many, many questions in this world. We obviously use it as much as possible. But that there are certain questions that can only be answered by faith. What have been the perspective of Dante based on uh, Thomas Aquinas, who was a very, very famous uh, medieval theologian at his time. In fact, somebody who we'll see speak in the sphere of the sun in the Paradiso. Not next week, but in a few weeks. In any case, this is how Beatrice first meets Dante. He's already having sort of a sad moment, Virgil having disappeared and being so close to him as a mother and a father. Well, Dante, though Virgil's leaving you, do not yet weep. <laughs> do not weep yet. You'll need your tears for what another sword must yet inflict. So she says she's going to cause him some pain. Just like an admiral who goes to stern and prow, there's that uh, ship metaphor, that sea metaphor, to see the officers who guide the other ships encouraging their tasks. So on the left side of the chariot I turned around when I had heard my name, which of necessity I transcribed here. This is the only time in the text that Dante's name gets mentioned explicitly. It was considered sort of in bad taste to put your name into your own poetry, but he does himself uh, name himself in this instance. So 
Uh, okay, I'm not going to have you write this down, but know that this will be there to give you further information on some of the Latin quotes that are mentioned by uh, Dante when Virgil disappears. Mani Bostate, Lilia Planis, give lilies with full hands. That's something said of Marcellus. It was said in book six of uh, uh, Virgil's Aeneid. Uh, it's a funereal thing to say. You give lilies at a funeral. And um, supposedly in Virgil's Aeneid, when that part was read in book six, to Octavia and uh, the uh, emperor Octavian, though he wasn't technically called uh, Octavian, about Marcellus, who was the son of Octavia, who had died, and who was the heir to the throne, uh, she fainted in sadness. And so the idea is that this is such a sad moment that Dante could, like we've seen him do many times, faint in sadness. All right, in any case, Beatrice, a couple of facts about her. She showed up, and she's pretty scornful of Dante. In fact, she explicitly says, you were supposed to stay in love with me, but you've given yourself to so many lower pleasures, like the siren, uh, lesser um, sorts of things than theological virtue. And so, a couple things about Beatri Beatrice. Facts. She died young. She was 24 when she died. That was only three years after she had been married, and recall that she was married to someone who very much was not Dante. Okay, so, recall... Beatrice was 24 when she died. It was three years after she had been married. Now, even though it was the case that Dante and Beatrice did not formally meet each other, she was first seen by Dante at age 9, which is why uh, Canto 9 is often considered uh, a very symbolic and special canto to Dante. Not only 9, but ones with 9 in them, 1929 as well. Uh, and uh, this extra stuff is just stuff to think about if you have the time, but again, well, we have to move very fast to Okay, now, as I was telling you, we've seen the procession of biblical symbols and the Bible. Now we have to see, uh, symbolically, church history. And some of this you already know. So we get our uh, penultimate piece of direct address, apostrophe. Consider reader, if I did not wonder when I saw something that displayed no movement, though its reflected image kept on changing, he's talking about there, the intertwined nature of the griffin continually changing colors, even though his eyes don't change perspectives, it just keeps, it's iridescent, it keeps changing right in front of him like quicksilver. This is a symbol for the intertwined human nature and divine nature in Jesus, who has 100% human nature, 100% divine nature. It is a paradox. We don't understand how that works because we cannot use human reason to understand it. The idea is that you have to use faith, like what Beatrice represents to understand it. It is in its goal, it is the eagle part of it, gold, and the lion part of it, remember that a griffin is both uh, two kings. The king of the sky, eagle, which represents Joe, and the king of the forest, uh, lion. Which is why if you're a big C.S. Lewis or the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe fan, people believe Aslan, the lion, to be a figure of Christ. A figure of Christ. In any case, the griffin is both those natures, human and divine, together. Gold indicating divine, and white and red indicating human who bleeds. All right. Um, I'm just going to skip that. All right, let's look at the quote, and then I will explain it to you. Never has lightning fallen with such swift motion from a thick cloud when it descends from the most distant limit in the heavens. That's a reference to Job there, lightning. As did the bird of Job, that, which is obviously a, an eagle, that I saw swoop down through the tree, tearing the bark as well as the new leaves and the new flower. It struck the chariot with all its force. The chariot twisted like a ship. Again, nautical metaphor. That's crossed by seas that now storm starboard and now port. I then saw, as it leaped into the body of that triumphal chariot, a fox that seemed to lack all on its nourishment. But as she railed against its squalid sins, my lady forced that fox to flight as quick as stripped of flesh its, pone, its bones permitted it. Then I could see the eagle plunge again down through the tree into the chariot and leave it feathered with its plumage, its feathers. And just like a voice from an embittered heart, a voice issued from heaven saying this, O oh, my small bark, your freight is wickedness. Then did the ground between the two wheels seemed to me to open from the earth. A dragon emerged. It drove its tail up through the chariot, and like a wasp, when it retracts its sting, drawing its venom tail back to itself, it dragged part of the bottom off, and went its way, undulating like a wave, and what was left was covered with the eagle's plumes, feathers, perhaps offered with sound and kind intent. That's a nation of Constantine. I'll talk about that in a moment. Much as grass covers fertile ground, and the pole shaft in both wheels were recovered in less time than the mouth must be kept open, when one size. Whew. Transfigured so, the saintly instrument grew heads. That's the chariot. It grows heads. Which sprouted from its parts. Three grew upon the pole shaft, and one at each corner. 
Three were horns like oxen, but four had just a single horn. Upon their foreheads, such monsters never have been seen before. <coughs> Last lines from Canto 32 before we finish with 33. Just like a fortress, set on a steep slope, securely seated there, under a whore, whose eyes were quick to rove, appeared to me. And I saw at her side erect a giant, and who served as her custodian, guardian. And they again, again, embraced each other. <coughs> but when she turned her wandering wanton eyes to me, then that ferocious Amador beat her from head to foot, then swollen with suspicion, fierce with anger, he untied the chariot, made monster, remember it has uh, uh, seven heads and ten crowns right now, dragging it into the wood so that I could not see either the horror of the strange chariot beast. Okay, that's very bizarre. What's all that mean? Let's explain. All right. Pietro commands Dante to observe and report what happens to the chariot, which is a dramatic allegory or story of Christian history. Now, the eagle. That represents the Roman Empire. The first thing that happens is it swoops down through the flowering tree, uh, that's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and strikes the chariot. What does this represent? It represents the Roman persecution of the earliest of the early church, the early fruits of the church. Okay, okay. But then right after you recall that we saw a fox. The fox represents heresies, especially Gnosticism. That was the biggest uh, heresy at the beginning of the Christian church. There are still Gnostics around. I think there's this Gnostic cent center in L.A. Um, in any case, this fox, which represents early heresies, and in particular Gnosticism, leaps into the chariot before being chased away by Beatrice, the true faith. You can see the allegory of her existence uh, being embodied there. Well, then the imperial eagle attacks again. But this attack is very different. It comes uh, several hundred years late, later. And when this imperial eagle attacks again, it leaves behind its plumes, its feathers. They're golden feathers. This is a representation of Constantine, the Roman emperor, who converted to Christianity in 336, giving uh, uh, land and wealth to the church. He helps to corrupt it by giving it something that seems good. It was a kind intention, <coughs> but it had evil effects. And that's something we'll actually talk about in the sphere of Jupiter. You can only do what you think is right. You cannot actually um, change the outcomes of things. You never know, even if you do something right, whether good or bad things will come from it as a human. And, well, that's why you just have to, uh, in, at least in the case of Dante, have faith. <coughs> Now, after the second attack by an eagle, now living uh, plumes, which uh, is a symbol for the donation of Constantine, a dragon comes out from the ground. That dragon is a representation of the nation of Islam, of the new come religion of Islam. Recall that Dante incorrectly believed that Islam was an outgrowth of Catholicism because he believed that uh, Muhammad, who was the founder of Islam, had been a, a Catholic cardinal who had not been elected pope and, and uh, then defected from the religion. This dragon rips the bottom of the chariot and parted it away. This is uh, Dante's perception of several people following a heresy, the heresy he would have considered of Islam and leaving the Christian faith. Okay, what's then left of the chariot sprouts seven monstrous heads, four with um, uh, one horn on them, three with two. Four plus uh, six equals ten, so there are ten horns on seven monstrous heads. This is an image from the book of Revelation that we heard about, written by John earlier, the last book of the Christian New Testament. This is a monster who, actually, if you read Revelation, has a lady, a wanton woman, described as a prostitute or harlot or whore, uh, riding on its back. And so this is the idea of the corrupted church. So, yes, moving on. Seated on this chariot, which is now a uh, seven-headed, ten-horned beast, is a loosely clad prostitute whose eyes are roving about looking uh, ostensibly for somebody to pay her to uh, give services. And this is what uh, Dante is directly comparing uh, the church to. Some lady who sells her services for money and is looking for somebody to pay her. Uh, which is n uh, n not a very pure idea of the church, to say the least. What this prostitute is doing on this seven-headed beast is embracing a giant. Now, if the prostitute represents the corrupted church, then the giant represents the French monarchy that paid money to the church and their unholy embrace or union. And I'll tell you who those French monarchs are. Here's an image of that giant kissing the uh, uh, 
eyes askance prostitute, and then you can see there the um, the seven-headed beast. So you only see about five heads there. In any case, here's another image by Gustav Dore after the William Blake. And so the giant, when it sees the prostitute look at Dante, brutally beats her, and then takes her and the chariot into the forest where Dante cannot see them. This is a representation of Philip the Fair, who was a French monarch in the 14th century, uh, and his hostile treatment of Pope Boniface VIII. He, um, uh, because of a disagreement between those two, he had Pope Boniface kidnapped, held for several days, finally released, but Boniface, because of the humiliation of that, would die several months later. Something interesting about this is the even-handedness of Dante. Though obviously he hates Boniface because of his um, the part he played in having Dante exiled, from Florence, he does recognize that Boniface, as a representation of the church, as its pope, does need to be treated, or does deserve to be treated in a particular way, a way that he was not treated, uh, or, or a way that he was not respected by Fr the French monarchy, in particular by Philip the Fair. And so, with the giant then taking the chariot, the church, away from Eden there, is also a representation of popes. Clement V taking the seat of the church, the papacy, from Rome to Avignon in southern France. He took it from one country to another. It would later, of course, be moved back to Rome. It is currently in Rome. And so, charming image to end on. No, usually most people say no. In any case, our final piece of apostrophe, uh, number 15, if reader. I had ampler space in which to write. I'd sing, though incompletely. That sweet drop for which my thirst was limitless. The ineffability topos here. He never has enough words or clear enough words to express what he's actually seen. But since all of the pages predispose, talking about fate here, though he's been so keen on free will during the purgatory, for this, the second canticle are full. The curb of art will not let me continue. From that most holy wave, I now return to Beatrice, remade. As new trees are renewed, when they bring forth new boughs, I was pure and prepared to climb unto the stars. Dante's will is now pure, and now he seeks pure intellectual understanding. And with his new heavenly guide, Beatrice, thrice happy Beatrice, Beatus means happy, and uh, tree, like triangle, means three, Dante ascends to heaven, otherwise known as celestial paradise. Know the difference between celestial paradise, that means paradise in the stars, and terrestrial paradise, that means paradise on earth. The final word of this canticle, just like in the Inferno, just like in the Purgat, or just like in the Paradiso, though uh, the Inferno doesn't get this right in your translation by C.H. White, or C.H. Sisson, sorry, I have White there, I should say Sisson, is uh, stars. The final word of this canticle is stars, just as it is in the Inferno, just as it is in the Paradiso. And the Italian word for that is stella, which is why we say when you do something very well that you did it stella. You're at the top did your best. And here is the image of this. All right, um, that was a lot, um, but that was what we had to do today, and good work and congratulations. Getting through the purgatory is no easy task.